kids, it's me, Mrs. Donahue. I don't have a great deal of time today, and it's sunny, and it's not going to be sunny again until like Sunday or forever in New England speak. Um, so I'm going to paint this desk and explain the Miller's Tale to you, because I'm just so talented. All right, so first off, I'm painting this desk because, as you guys know, I really enjoy painting. Um, I paint outdoors mainly, so because I've been painting for, you know, the epic amount of time as three weeks. So I need an indoor desk where I can just store my paints and put my easel and all of that good fun stuff. So I found this really awesome desk on Craigslist. Excitement, and now I'm just painting it over. Um, it had this weird little funky, I don't know, prissy little thing on it, so I ripped that off. I, I sanded it down to the best of my abilities, which means that I spent approximately five minutes sanding it down and then realized I'm covering in black. What do I care? And it's going to be where I keep my paint supplies and put my easel and basically just make a great big huge mess. So I'm going to be cool with this. Uh, and it's streaky, it's streaky, and I don't care. So that's, that's why I'm doing this. Uh, okay, so we start off... Uh, the Miller's Tale. The Miller's Tale happens right on the tail end of the knight's tale. So the knight has told his tale, and as we know in Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, the knight is supposedly this very, very noble man. He's very upstanding. He's there to get absolution for perceived sins, um, which of course in contemporary times, yes, murdering lots of people because they have different religious ideology than you is of course a sin. Uh, but at the time that Chaucer was writing this, eh, it was a little gray area. So he's there and then he gives his tail his tail's weird um and then the, the host goes oh that was such a great tale who's gonna be next and of course the miller being drunk as a skunk jumps up and says i'm gonna be next Rah, let me do it and the host tries to say like you know what maybe someone else can go next hint and the miller threatens to leave if he's not allowed to go next so he, you know, the host acquiesces and he says, all right, fine, this will be great. Maybe he'll pass out halfway through the story and we don't have to worry about it. He doesn't. Uh, and so the Miller starts telling his story and he apologizes straight off the bat. He tells everybody, listen, I'm drunk, so don't fact check this. And, um, you know, it might get like a little, you know, lost in the telling. So just, just go with it. And he says, I'm going to tell a story about a woman who cheats on her husband and how she gets away with it. And the Reeve jumps up and the Reeve takes great offense to this. And he's like, I don't want to hear this libelous accusation. These are, you know, these aren't appropriate stories. There's ladies present. So don't, don't tell this. And the Miller shuts him down very quickly. He screams at him and he's like, I'm going to tell the story and I want to tell da, 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 da. And so we are off into the Miller's tale. This is horrible. This is like, this is a horrible, horrible job. So the Miller's Tale is about a carpenter named John who marries a very young, pretty woman named Allison. And Chaucer takes great pains to make sure that the Miller gives us this kind of like pseudo moral idea that men should always marry their like and that he was begging for trouble when he married someone who is so much younger and so much prettier than he. And that's actually going to be um, a common theme that you see in a lot of other different tales and tellings. The wife of Bath is going to speak at great lengths about how like a man can't handle having a pretty wife because it's just too upsetting for him. Um, she's got her own thing going on so like we'll, we'll tackle that and that's in another video. Uh, Allison and uh, the, the carpenter, they, they get along, they have a pretty okay life. Um, and the carpenter, to take in extra money, takes in boarders into his home. And one of the boarders is a young student from Oxford, or rather a scholar, I should just say. Uh, and that guy is known as Handy Nicholas. Ooh. Nicholas is handy because he's handy with the ladies. See how clever that was? It was so clever. Um, and he... Oh God, this is just, this is awful. Uh, he immediately forms an attachment to Allison. He's, he's very into her. Um, the story's a little like kind of upsetting in that there's a scene where he just kind of, it sounds like he just comes up from behind her, grabs her legs and then forcefully has sex with her. However, she enjoys it. So I, I don't really know how to talk about it. I mean, it's, I don't know, million year old text. So Allison's all into this and she's just like, oh, whatever you do, make sure my husband doesn't find out because he'll kill me. And so the liaison goes on for a little while and the poor husband is just as cockholded and silly as can be. 
And Nick gets the idea that he wants to spend the entire night in Allison's arms. And so Allison's like, all right, but you have to figure out how to make that go. It's not my job to figure out how we're going to spend the evenings together. That's your job. And so Nicholas is like, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to put my, my little brains into this to figure this out. Now, meanwhile, story B, there is another guy hot for Allison, and his name is Absalon. Uh, now, Absalon is a local kind of like a uh, parish person, and he really has a hots for Allison. He always goes out of her way to try and like attract her eye. And a couple of the things he does is he takes part in the morality plays that are put, being put on by the church. And of course, Allison's just like, nah, I got, I got handy Nicholas, so I'm all set. I don't need, you know, no, no skeevy Absalon. So everything, everything's kind of fine. She's got her man on the side. She's got her man on the street, I guess. Uh, and now she's got some guy just kind of like, I don't know, making eyes at her from, from across the way. So Allison's like all that in a bag of chips. So finally, Handy Nicholas gets the bright idea of how they can spend the entire night together. He comes up with this silly plan, and so to start the plan off, he hides up in his room for an entire, like, day, and pretty much the weekend. He really freaks John out, because when John finally goes up there to say, like, you know, to go find out what's wrong, he first sends a servant, and the servant comes down, and he says, I can't open the door, you know, you gotta, you gotta go up there and find out for yourself. So John goes up there, he finally bangs down the door, and there's Nicholas, just in this weird trance, staring up into the sky, mouth agape and everything like that. Now, backstory I probably should have given you about Handy Nicholas is aside from being a scholar, he's also a big fan of astrology and all that nonsense, which, I mean, I guess I shouldn't be calling nonsense, but it's nonsense. So... He's, he's got, like, this insight to the occult that John pretty much buys into hook, line, and sinker. And so when they finally pull John or Nicholas out of the trance, Nicholas is like, oh, my God, I have been given divine knowledge from God, and I know when the next flood is coming. And so John's just like, oh, my God, you have to tell me, too. And so Nicholas is like, okay, I will. And uh, it turns out that the flood is actually going to happen on Monday night. Convenient. Uh, and they devise a way to save themselves. Now, this is where it gets kind of a little, like, sad, I suppose. John's very first thought is, oh, my God, my poor wife, how can I save her? And I'm just like, oh, if you knew the other lines of this story, man, you wouldn't be thinking that. That's just, that's just kind of sad. But it's also sort of funny, so we're going to laugh at him. So he's thinking, how can I save my wife? How can I save my wife? And so Nicholas is like, don't worry, I've got it figured out. What you're going to do is you're going to run around town and you're going to buy these great big huge kneading tubs. So just think of them as like large bathtubs. Or if you really want to think of it one way, um, think of it as like that thing that Lucy got into in that one episode where she walked around and crushed all the grapes. They're in those things. And so he instructs John to go out and buy three of them because, well, there's three people. Uh, and he is going to hang them from the ceiling and then stock them with provisions for a day and an ax to cut the rope so that when the water gets up to the level of the tubs hanging from the ceiling, he can use the ax to cut the ropes and then cut a hole in the ceiling, thus setting them three to float for the entire day that the flood will last, and then they will ride upon the waves like Noah and his wife. Oh my God. John falls for it, of course, because, I mean, it wouldn't be much of a story if the story was called John figured it out and then beat Nick to death. Um, so he goes out, he buys the things. Nicholas instructs him not to tell another soul. He, of course, tells Allison, but he doesn't tell another soul. And Allison, who had been in on the joke, knew. So she's like, oh, my God, you have to do everything you can to possibly save our lives. So to go and buy those tubs. She also sounds like Minnie Mouse in my head. So he's running around. He looks sad. Everybody notices that he looked kind of sad that day. And meanwhile, Absalom is thinking, how can I possibly get myself, you know, at least a kiss from Allison? Because that will, that will make me happy and tide me over. So the famous Monday night comes, and um, Nicholas had instructed John to say that, you know, he can't lie with his wife in the same tub, because if they're going to be saved by God, then they both have to be free from sin, which means they can't sleep together. So they all climb into their tubs, they wait for John to go asleep, and they can tell that John's asleep because he very loudly snores when he's sleeping, so they're like, oh, okay, he's asleep. And then they climb down out of their tubs, and they proceed to have sex. 
So meanwhile, in other story that has Absalom to do with it, Absalom is wandering around the town at night, and he's like, I want to get a kiss from Allison. Ah, I'm such a big whiner. So he goes over to Allison's house, and he starts talking to her through the window, and he's like, Allison, my love, come to the window. And she's having zero of this. So she's just like, get out of here, you loser, leave. Hey, UPS guy. I like making these videos because they absolutely make me look nuts. Uh, so she kicks him out of there and she's like, get out of here. And he's like, if you but give me one kiss, then I shall leave you alone forever. And she's like, you swear to God, you will leave me alone if I give you one kiss. And meanwhile, Nicholas is like, shh, shh, I got a wicked good idea. Hang out for two seconds. And she's like, okay, cool. And so Absalom's like, yes, but a kiss and I shall leave. And she's like, okay, you have to be a man of your word. And so, you know, she goes, pucker up then. So he closes his eyes, he gives a big smooch, and right at the time she was about to thrust her face through the window, she thrusts her butt through the window, and he kisses her on the bum. You are smart, and I'm assuming you're also reading this literature, so you know that there's a slight interesting problem with the fact that he did not kiss her on a cheek. The line is exactly, you bearded him. So go ahead and fill in all the naughty bits yourself. I'm painting my desk. Absalom is of course furious with this. And just as quickly as a man can fall in love with a woman, he has decided he violently hates her. So off he goes into the night to plot his revenge. Nicholas and Allison are laughing hysterically. John is dead asleep to the entire world. Evidently, he sleeps great, which, you know, yeah, I guess a person with a, with a non-guilty conscience probably sleeps great. Fair enough. And Absalom comes up to a friend of his who is a smithy. And he goes, hey, can I borrow this red hot poker from you? And the smithy goes, why do you need it? And Absalom's like, none of your business. Can I have it? And so the smithy's like, all right, sure, take it away. So off he goes back to Allison's house with a red hot poker, fill in the blanks, right? And so he calls up to the window and he's like, one more kiss, one more kiss. And so Allison and Nick thinking, all right, cool. You know, schmuck wants to fall for the same trick twice. Let's do this. And Nicholas, who had gotten up to go to the bathroom, of course, Chaucer puts it a little bit more crudely than I just did, but that's Chaucer for you. Um, he's like, my turn. So he sticks his butt out through the window. And right at that moment, Absalom smacks him right in the butt with a red hot poker. And Chaucer is pretty good at giving you the details. It sounds like skin came off and hair came off and everything sieged. And so John's running around screaming, water, water, for God's sakes, water. John then wakes up hears water, thinks it's the flood, cuts the ropes, the tub comes crashing down onto the ground. All of the neighbors come into the house because they're like, what in God's name is going on in here? They see John, they see the mess. Nothing John could do could convince them of the fact that he was not completely nuts. Allison and Nick immediately start to convince the neighbors that John had gone crazy and was so afraid of the flood, he had done this all on his own. They commit him. And I believe Allison and Nick live happily ever after and Absalom is absolutely fine. I mean, I'm going to go ahead and assume with the medical care of the time, Nick probably lived happily ever after for the next like 15 days and then died of like septic. So like probably, um, but it's not really a morality tale. It's just this funny, funny joke really. And that's what I like about the Miller's tale. Cause while it's disgusting and putrid and awful, it doesn't really make me think like the wife of Bath's tale did or the Prioress's tale. Now the Prioress's tale only made me think like, wow, you are crazy, horribly anti-Semitic and I hope you get hit by a car. Um, which of course those didn't exist at the time, but I can hope. Uh, so it's just a funny, funny story. I guess if there was any kind of insight that we could get from it, if you think a Miller is not a low class person because nobody who's truly low class would be able to go on this, you'll notice that even the yeoman had some money with him and he'd be like, I guess the lowest of all the low class guys, or oh, maybe the cook would be, but the cook was just hired help. He wasn't really on pilgrimage. He was paid to go on the pilgrimage, I suppose. 
um, that it shows that the middle class or the lower class, they're gonna tell gross body stories, but that's okay because like that's sort of just what middle class people do. And you know, everybody in the audience, they, they probably like laughed up their sleeves and rolled their eyes. And probably if I know the wife of Bath half as well as I do, and I kind of know that wife of Bath pretty well, she probably laughed her butt off and told the joke in, in different company as well. Cause it is kind of a funny joke. I mean, the guy's screaming, water, water, and it's the flood and then down comes the tub. And the whole thing about being poked in the butt by a red hot poker. That sounds horrific, but it's also really, really funny. All right, so that is The Miller's Tale. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope this desk doesn't look half as crappy to you as it does to me. I think I made a lot of mistakes. But again, as I said, it's just this thing that I'm gonna keep my art supplies in, so like, that's okay. I also have a chair I have to reupholster, so good luck to me. Bye. I thought I'd show you guys the desk now that it's all done, looking all pretty and nice. I think it's not that bad of a job. I mean, obviously, this is kind of craptastic, but at the same time, my easel's gonna go there, so I care. I like that it's matte black. And this is just life advice to you guys. If you ever see a really great, beautiful, ornate chair and you think to yourself, oh, I wanna paint that ornate chair, you just go right ahead and slap yourself in the face because there is nothing on the planet that is worse than painting a chair. Goodbye.